All right, so uh, today we're going to be working out of a different book than we have the last three lessons. We're going to be working out of uh, Aviation Weather, which is an FAA publication, also known as, as uh, Advisory Circular 00-06B. This is sort of the, the FAA's Bible on weather, you might say. It's even broke um, into chapters and verses. <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, goes into a quite a bit of detail about uh, weather theory, so that's what we'll be spending the next uh, two ground school sessions talking about. Uh, today we're going to cover hopefully about the first half of the book and next time we'll cover the second half if uh, all the timing goes according to plan here. So we'll start out and talk a little bit about the origins of uh, the weather that we experience. So in essence, uh, all of the weather that we experience is due in some way or another to solar heating of uh, the Earth's surface by the sun. So uh, the sun obviously shines down on the ground and on the ocean, warms up the ground, warms up the water, but it warms up at different rates. So certain, some areas absorb more heat, some areas absorb less heat. And uh, the uneven heating of the ground and the uneven heating of the atmosphere then is what, in essence, in a very, the very basic level, sets up our weather systems. So, obviously, uh, the uh, ground, hard, dry ground, will absorb uh, more solar energy and re radiate more solar energy than oceans will typically. The ocean will just uh, dissipate that heat into a, a huge, huge mass of water and uh, that uh, differential in temperature causes air to warm up at different rates. Uh, as we've talked about in some of the previous uh, ground school lessons, warmer air is less dense, cooler air is more dense, and as you get changes in air density, you start to get movement. Um, so how does this all work? Uh, here in uh, chapter two of Aviation Weather, uh, we're looking at uh, figure 2-3 here. Um, it just shows uh, the solar radiation in the form of uh, light anywhere from uh, the uh, top end of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum all the way down to uh, infrared uh, comes off the sun and some of it hits the earth. Uh, of course infrared is uh, the wavelength of light that carries the most heat. Um, so as the sunlight strikes the earth it warms it up. The earth uh, absorbs that and will eventually re-radiate that back out into space um, as solely infrared, so it will take in all of the spectra of light and radiate mostly in the infrared. Uh, so if you were to take a picture of the dark side of the Earth with an infrared camera, you would still be able to see the Earth there to some extent. Moving on, uh, not only do different parts of the Earth absorb uh, different amounts of solar radiation based on what they are, but also based on what angle the sunlight strikes it at. So near the equator, the sun is shining directly down on the surface of the Earth, and that uh, will impart more energy to the ground, whereas if the sun is shining at an oblique angle to the ground, it'll impart less energy per square foot or square meter or whatever unit of measurement you want to use. So here in figure 2-4 we have a good uh, illustration of this where you have a certain amount of sunlight shining down. If it's shining straight down that uh, is spread over a certain amount of ground. If it's shining at an angle that same amount of sunlight is spread over a much larger area of earth and so imparts less energy for each unit of area. That's why it's warmer at the equator. Right. So the uh, Earth absorbed more energy at the equator. This is why it's warmer typically in the tropics. It's also 
why uh, as the sun warms up the ocean, you tend to have more water vapor in the atmosphere near the equator in the tropics. So that's why you tend to have more rain uh, in tropical climates. The sunlight warms up that water, it evaporates more as it, uh, as the air gets more and more water in it, you get more clouds, more rain, and that's why the equator and the tropics tend to be warmer and wetter than, uh, for example, we are up here in Wisconsin. We're, We're about, wetter, we just have white stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so, looking at um, how does the solar heating of the ground transfer to the air. Well, the sunlight doesn't heat the air directly very much. What it tends to do is it'll heat up, as we said, the ground or the ocean, and the heat radiating from the ground will then heat up the air, because air uh, is pretty transparent. It doesn't stop or absorb much light. It doesn't have a hard mass that can absorb the heat. Right. It doesn't have a hard mass, and it doesn't have uh, anything that blocks light, you know, if it's if it's opaque, then it's absorbing some kind of light. And air, since you can basically see right through it, obviously is not absorbing very much. So what absorbs the light is the ground. The ground then radiates heat in the form of infrared, which then helps to heat up the air just above it. And they have an example here of how uh, that works in the case of a stove. You have the uh, heating element or the flame of a stove radiating heat into a pan. Um, they also talk about here if you're boiling water in a pan you get uh, convection currents from the steam coming up off the water and that gets into a little bit of what we'll talk about a little bit later with uh, circulation of air, but that uh, is sort of a, a microcosm of what can happen in the Earth's atmosphere. So the uh, heat coming off of a boiling pot of water, when you can see the steam coming from a steam kettle, you see it move in the air and it's creating create those... Sort of, sort of a vortex Yep, almost. and it's because it's moving and there's different temperatures, that's how you get little winds, right? Exactly, so. precisely. Um, and uh, since uh, the sunlight strikes the Earth obviously more directly at the equator, less directly as you get away from the equator, but also the Earth is tilted on its axis. So as it goes around the sun, the Earth is tilted 23 and a half degrees, which means on one side of the sun you're getting more sunlight uh, shining on the southern hemisphere, when the Earth comes around to the other side, it's still tilted that 23 and a half degrees, but the sun is shining more on the northern hemisphere, and this creates seasons. So right now, about uh, January, February kind of time here in Wisconsin, we're uh, on the, uh, the side that's tilted away from uh, the sun. We're receiving less solar energy, and it's winter. Uh, conversely, in the southern hemisphere, it's tilted towards the sun, and it's receiving more solar energy, so it's summer in the southern hemisphere when it's winter up here in the northern hemisphere. And uh, that, of course, affects how much uh, solar radiation is absorbed by each hemisphere and creates seasons. So here in uh, figure 2-7 you have a, uh, a chart also showing that places that are further away from the equator have a larger difference uh, because at the equator you're closer to that place that stays in it all the time. That's right. Why. And furthermore, what they're also showing here in figure 2-7 is places that are closer to a large body of water, in this case they're using San Francisco as an example, so the Pacific Ocean, have a more moderate uh, temperature change than places that are surrounded by land because as we talked about the ocean tends to dissipate that heat energy throughout a huge, huge volume of water, whereas the uh, when the sun shines out on the land, it re-radiates it directly back into the atmosphere. So a coastal city like San Francisco will have much less temperature variation 
than their example is Kansas City in the middle of the country. Even though they're fairly close to the same latitude, uh, you'll have much more muted seasons in San Francisco than you do in Kansas City. Do you have to go very far inland from San Francisco for that to change and you don't get the benefit of being out there on the ocean, say? It decreases fairly rapidly as you move away from the coast. Um, San Francisco, the west coast of the United States in general, is an inter interesting case because you also have, you get a little bit inland and you have a mountain range, and that also essentially oh, stops. Oh, that, that, yeah, the, I remember reading about that get, farther in the chapter. You get uh, the Rocky Mountains, that pretty much stops all of that ocean effect from coming any further inland. Yeah, I've been reading about that. So we'll get to get, that later, won't we? You, yeah, right. And you get into, uh, like, Nevada uh, kind of area, uh, and it's just, you don't get much, if any, of that uh, coastal effect. Whereas if you look at a place like Europe, where the, the mountains are much further inland, uh, that uh, that uh, maritime air mass, the the uh, the air that's coming in off the ocean, gets much further inland uh, because the mountain range isn't right on the coast there like it is on the west coast of the U.S. Now, the uh, the temperature of the atmosphere also uh, decreases with not not only typically with as you move away from the equator but also it decreases as you move up in altitude and this is because as you move up in altitude uh, the air pressure decreases because you have less air above you and as the pressure decreases the temperature also decreases we have a uh, an equation called the ideal gas law which maybe we can put up on screen here it's the ideal gas law it basically states that uh, the temperature of a gas, uh, in this case air, is uh, proportional to its pressure. So that as you uh, increase the pressure, uh, the temperature also increases. As you decrease the pressure, the temperature also decreases. So as you go up in the atmosphere, the pressure decreases, the temperature decreases. And uh, this we can talk about uh, a lapse rate uh, being the rate at which the temperature decreases as you go up in altitude. And typically, uh, we have something we call uh, a standard adiabatic lapse rate. Adiabatic is a term which means if you take a parcel of air and you lift it up, uh, through the atmosphere, the pressure will decrease. That parcel of air that you took at the surface will expand because the pressure is going down. And as it expands, the temperature decreases. So uh, adiabatic lapse rate is the amount of cooling that air will experience as its pressure decreases with altitude. So uh, there's a standard uh, average of this now. The actual, what we actually see as far as the temperature decreasing with altitude can vary a lot depending on local conditions. And sometimes the temperature can even go up with altitude. We'll talk about that later. But uh, in general, the temperature uh, will tend to decrease at uh, roughly 3 degrees Celsius per thousand feet of altitude. So. Uh, as you go up in the atmosphere, the average temperature will decrease by that much. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, things like local weather systems, even things like uh, sun heating up uh, the ground, causing air to rise, those can all affect what we see uh, at, in the real world as an actual lapse rate, but the uh, the standard uh, amount of cooling or the standard lapse rate gives us a baseline which uh, we can use to discuss a lot of more theoretical aspects of weather. Um, so here in uh, figures 2-8 uh, and 2-9 they show uh, some different uh, ways that the temperature can vary with altitude. 
depending on uh, various factors. Um, you can have uh, places where you go up in altitude and for a while the temperature just stays the same. Uh, they call that an isothermal layer. Iso just means the same. So isothermal is same temperature. So an isothermal layer is just a layer of air where the temperature doesn't change as you go up through it. Uh, you can also have a temperature inversion where that's where the temperature actually goes up uh, as you move up in altitude. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what can cause each of those a little bit later, but uh, just for now to understand that uh, the average lapse rate of the atmosphere is not necessarily what we'll actually measure at any given location. Um, now, we've talked about how uh, different areas uh, absorb different amounts of sunlight, different amounts of heat, uh, and we've also talked about how as the sun heats up the ocean and any kind of water really, uh, it'll tend to evaporate more into the atmosphere. So this gets into uh, the water cycle, or they call it the hydrologic cycle, just a fancy term way of saying the same thing. And you might have learned about the water cycle in elementary school, um, basically how uh, the sun warms up bodies of water, the water evaporates into water vapor, that warm air rises, uh, will typically condense into clouds, eventually the clouds may form rain, the rain falls back down to the earth and runs in back into the ocean again and you have your complete cycle. Evaporation, uh, water evaporates, gets uh, lifted by warm air, water condenses into clouds, further condenses into rain, which then falls onto the surface of the earth, runs back into the ocean where it can evaporate again. And this is our water cycle. So the earth typically doesn't gain or lose any water. We have you know, a certain amount of water on the earth. It's you know, almost unimaginably huge, but there is a, <laughs> only a certain quantity of it. Uh, but it just keeps changing from a liquid evaporating into a gas, condensing into clouds, rain, falling back to the earth, and so on and so forth. Um, and as we talked about, when you see the, the steam coming off a pot or something, um, how that you can see that warm air moves a little bit. It may rise around the edges and even fall a little bit in the center. Uh, That's when it starts cooling off and it can't suspend cools itself off and, and it just falls, falls down right. again and as it as that happens it'll also tend to uh, move so air will tend to move from somewhere where uh, the air is rising to somewhere where it cools off and sinks again and you get uh, a horizontal movement of air based on the temperature difference as well as vertical movement and moving air uh, is what leads to most of what the weather systems, weather conditions that we experience. Um, now a couple of things to talk about as we talk about um, evaporation of water into the air. Uh, the water ha the the water vapor in the air uh, is suspended in the air, but the air can only uh, contain a certain amount of it. And if, if you get to that limit of the amount of uh, water that air can contain, it will start condensing out in the form of clouds or water droplets or rain. Um, but that amount of wa water that the air can contain depends on temperature. So warmer air can contain more water in suspension than colder air can. And the uh, you might have heard the term relative humidity. The, uh, that is just a term to say how much water is in the air as a percentage of what it can, how much water the air can hold. Um, but another term that we want to introduce here is dew point, which is the dew point temperature, as the name implies, is the temperature at which water will condense out of the air and form dew. So as the, uh, if you take a parcel of air, let's say the air is at uh, 70 degrees, say, if you start cooling it down, well, 
at a certain point, we talked about how warm air contains, can contain more water in it than cold air. So as you cool that air down, uh, you'll, cert you'll eventually get to the point where the amount of water that the air can contain is the same or less than the amount of water that it actually does contain. And at that point, uh, the water will have to come out of suspension in the air in the form of uh, fog or dew, hence the name dew point. Uh, so the dew point temperature or the dew point is the temperature that you have to cool air to in order to force water to come out of suspension in the form dew, fog, clouds, rain, Which is anything. why in the summer and our dew points are 70, 75 degrees, it's unbearably humid and right. nobody wants to go outside. Exactly. And in the, in, at night in the summertime, as the air cools down, um, you know, we might get down to low temperatures in the summertime of 65 degrees, 55 degrees even, depending on uh, what the weather's doing. And if you have a dew point of 70, and let's say the air is, you know, 95 degrees in the heat of the summer, and it cools down to uh, 65 degrees, the dew point is 70. Well, it can't really uh, cool all the way to 65. It's going to actually get stopped at uh, 70 because as that water condenses, that, rele that actually releases heat into the air and prevents it from cooling any further. That's why humid nights are uncomfortable. Exactly. Um, and uh, figures 3-2 and 3-3 three three, uh, showcase uh, this graphically. You can see uh, how the uh, dew point versus the temperature relate to relative humidity. So in their example, if the dew point is 11 degrees and the temperature is 22 degrees, uh, looks like they're using Celsius here, uh, then the relative humidity is 50%. If the dew point is 11 degrees and the temperature is 15, then the relative humidity is 75%. And if the temperature and dew point are both uh, 11 degrees, then the relative humidity is 100%. We said the air is saturated. It has as much water as it can possibly contain at that temperature. It's probably raining. Or foggy <laughs> or some, something or of that it's nature. It's probably not friendly to be out in. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about how water evaporates into the air, but you can also have uh, a, a different kind of change of state. Um, you can have, obviously water can freeze into ice or it can evaporate into water vapor. But you can also have, uh, at, at very low temperatures, you can have uh, water go straight from solid, being ice, straight to vapor uh, through a process called either sublimation, if it's going from ice in directly into water vapor without going through liquid in between, that's sublimation. If it's going from uh, water vapor and going directly into solid ice form, that's called deposition. And uh, when we see frost form in the mornings in the winter time, that's an example of deposition. So the water vapor in the atmosphere, although there isn't very much of it in the winter, there is still some. It's why do the frost only happens at the 30s and you get down yep. or close to 30 degrees. Yeah. When you get down into the 20s, it's too cold to hold the water to do the thing, right? Exactly. So there's only so much water vapor that can be deposited on a surface. But as the same as when the temperature cools down in the evening in the summertime, the water vapor condenses into droplets and we get dew. Uh, in the wintertime, when it's very cold, the water vapor will, uh, it can't condense into liquid because it's too cold, so it goes directly from vapor to solid in the form of frost, and that's uh, deposition. Um, so you have uh, from liquid to vapor, evaporation, liquid into vapor, condensation, vapor into liquid, 
obviously liquid to solid is melting and freezing, and then we have sublimation and deposition, as we just talked about. So those I was wondering what that was called when snow disappears and it's 15 degrees. Yeah, that's sublimation. And it's the same process if you fill an ice tray up and leave it in your freezer. Ex the ice gets smaller and smaller until with time because yep. of until that. Until eventually, uh, not too long ago, I forgot a tray of ice in my uh, freezer. I left it there for about six months, and when I pulled it out again, there was nothing. Just a little bit of frost in the bottom. Basically. A little, a little, you know, sediment from your water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. a little bit of, little bit of uh, calcium. That was about yep. it. <laughs> yep. Can't say I've never done that. <laughs> so... Um, we've talked a little bit about this, but uh, heat imbalances, chapter four in the uh, aviation weather here, um, how we get uh, heat imbalances, so different areas are heated up by different amounts, um, and also as the, uh, as the sun shines down, onto the surface that uh, heats up the surface of the earth that radiates heat in the form of infrared light that will radiate or shine infrared it says light technically you could say it shines upward in the Look infrared. At it through an infrared camera you'll see it shining exactly from the earth and then it'll uh, either go straight out into space and radiate back into space away from the earth or it might hit something which bounces that back down to the earth uh, clouds, so water vapor, uh, tends to bounce uh, infrared radiation back down towards the surface, so that's why it stays warmer on a cloudy night than it does on yep, a clear night. In the night. summer, when it's cloudy, it'll, it won't cool down nearby as much as on a clear night. And winter is time, the same thing. Um, it can also hit things like carbon dioxide, which also has a similar effect in the atmosphere. It, uh, the infrared radiation will tend to reflect off of carbon dioxide back down towards or scatter and it'll go in all directions but it'll scatter some back down towards the earth uh, various other compounds in the atmosphere methane uh, any number of other uh, gases will cause that <coughs> heat to be reflected or scattered back down towards the earth instead of radiating out away um, and since the uh, we haven't talked about this too much yet but uh, variations in clouds, so obviously sometimes it's cloudy, sometimes it's clear. So uh, cloudy night, where it's cloudy at night, you'll tend to reflect more uh, infrared radiation or heat back down to the earth. Where it's clear, you'll tend to lose more out into space. And this further contributes to heat imbalances, so some areas being warmer, some areas being colder. Uh, and as we talked about, when you have an area that's warmer, it tends to cause air to rise. An area that's cooler tends to cause air to sink. And to get from one, you know, if it rises, then it has to come down sometime. So then it, to, to come down, it has to move to where there's a cooler temperature to sink again. And that's how you get uh, movement of air across the surface, which we experience as wind primarily. So, uh, figure 4-2 uh, shows that uh, very effectively where uh, clear night will tend to have a lot more heat that radiates out away from the earth and a cloudy night will tend to contain more heat uh, down towards the surface. Um, you can also have on a smaller scale uh, the sun shining down in the daytime on the surface of the earth that'll heat up the air and you can have uh, a column or a bubble of rising air over uh, something that absorbs heat like a blacktop parking lot is a good example of that and here in figure 4-3 you see how the sun heats up the surface of the earth that heats up the air just above it and that air will tend to rise now depending on how large and how strong that heating is, um, you'll either get a bubble, as is actually shown here in figure 4-3, um, which can separate from the, uh, the source of the heating and just sort of drift away. You, you, know, you can't really see the bubble of hot air because it's air, it's, trans mm -hmm. it's transparent, but 
you can get uh, bubbles of hot air coming off things like parking lots and things. And plowed fields. Plowed fields. You got all yep. green corn out there, and you got yep. one field that's brown. That will exactly grab some more heat. So if the area that's being heated up by the sun is large enough, then you'll get sort of more, instead of a bubble of rising air, you'll get a column of rising air where the uh, sun heats the ground, the ground heats the air, the air rises, and then more cool air will come in from all sides to replace it. That cool air will get heated up also and rise as well, and more will come in to replace it, get heated up, and you get sort of a continuous column of rising air. Uh, we call this a thermal, where uh, you have a column of rising air. Now, as we talked about, if you take a parcel of air, uh, like the bubble that we just talked about, and you, you lift it up in the atmosphere, uh, the pressure will go down. That, that uh, parcel or that bubble of air will expand, mm -hmm. and its temperature will tend to cool off. So you get that bubble of warm air, uh, which rises and tends to cool. Um, it may cool faster than the air around it, or it may cool slower, and that uh, affects whether it will tend to only go up a certain distance and stop, or if it'll keep going further and further up. Um, and particularly if it goes, f if it's conditions where that bubble or that column of rising air keeps on going further and further up, um, you'll get to a point where that bubble of air has expanded so much that it cools the air to the to its dew point, and then you'll get a cloud. So. Uh, if you look on a sunny day, you'll see all the white puffy clouds all around. And what that is, is columns or bubbles of rising air that have risen to the point where they've hit their dew point because they've cooled down enough as they expand. And as they hit their dew point, the uh, water vapor in the atmosphere will condense into microscopic droplets, which will create what we see as a cloud. Which is why my RC plane buddies that fly gliders, they look for clouds that kind of have a gray bottom on them. And they, yep. as they float over, they get up next to the clouds and exactly. they get the lift. And I, I had a glider for a while and I researched thermals. And I remember yep. one thing they told us was if it's a still day in the summer and you all of a sudden feel a breeze, a thermal just went by. Yep. It's right over you. Yep. Or they would put little mini wind socks, which is just a piece of fabric on a string up yep. around the field, and they would look for those to move. And when they moved, they knew there was thermal passing there. Some of the competition guys do that. And yep. That's about the limit of what I learned about thermal. So this makes a little more sense now on yep. a little bit higher scientific scale. But yep. it's, it's a fascinating science that you can study forever and never figure it out. And full-scale glider pilots do the same kind of thing. Oh, yeah. But, of course, we don't have the... Uh, uh, advantage of having those little uh, yeah. rib ribbons down. No, on you the have ground to look for ground run. things. You yeah. Know? When I had my glider, I would always at the field I fly. I was right on a street, so I would always just bring it right down the street over the asphalt and try and hold my altitude there. Yep. We don't get as many thermals here as they do down south. Yep. And you can see Figure 4-4 shows that. Um, 4-5 basically shows the same thing as we've already talked about about. Uh, sun striking the earth more directly near the equator giving more energy but just shows it in a slightly different way. Um, figure 4-6 shows that uh, tilt of the earth that I was talking about that causes the seasons as we move around the earth um, shows how near uh, December 22nd the winter solstice which is the shortest day of the year in the northern hemisphere not many people uh, around here like that day. <laughs> no, it get, stays start getting longer after that, right? Yeah, so it's, it's all downhill from there. <laughs> but uh, and then in the summer solstice, June twenty second or thereabouts, um, you have the longest day. You have the most heating of the atmosphere. I was, I never really understood. Well, I understood that how that yeah. worked, but it never really hit home to me until I moved up here. When I was a kid, I grew up in Houston. Then I moved to Miami, which was just a little farther south. Yeah. But when I moved from Miami to Wisconsin, in the summertime, it's like, holy cow, I'm going to work, and it's 4 in the morning, and the sun's up already. Yeah. And then I could go out fishing until 9.30, 9.45, and it's still bright out. Yeah. Where in Florida, it was your days are more the same length all year because you're closer to that yep. equator. And, the and that's when I realized, wow, that's why when you get to Alaska, you have 
two months of sun. Right, and then two months of dark. That would <laughs> not be good. <laughs> so, figure 4-8 here shows uh, the variation in temperature over the course of a day. So, um, you might think that the maximum temperature would happen at noon when you have the most sunlight, but actually that's not the case. Um, you have, uh, through the night, the, uh, the earth is cooling off, or the portion of it you know, that's on that side is cooling off, the ground is cooling off, and it'll keep cooling as long as there's no sun shining on it. So the coolest temperature actually tends to be just about sunrise. Yep. And then as the sun comes up, it starts warming the ground up, temperature goes up, and it'll keep going up as long as more sunlight is being uh, shined on it. So the peak temperature is uh, not quite as close to sunset as the minimum temperature is to sunrise, but the uh, the maximum temperature will occur usually in the late afternoon. It's usually around three or four in the yeah, middle of summer, isn't it? Mo yep. Most of us know this on an instinctual level, but some people may know because the ground's just sitting there baking with the sun hitting it. It just keeps, even though the sun's not as yep. directly on it, it's just it's like a surface. You know, the longer you leave something on your stove, the hotter it's going to get. Yep. So they show here how, as the uh, amount of solar radiation varies, you have the most sunlight coming down at noon, but uh, you keep having enough sunlight to keep it heating up more and more until about three or four o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of the summer, or maybe one or two o'clock in the afternoon in the winter, <laughs> which yeah, is like right now. Yep. So we've talked about how the uh, air pressure decreases as you go up in altitude. So uh, typically, um, the uh, we talk about a standard air pressure, which uh, here in this country we typically measure as inches of mercury. So. Uh, like you'd see on a barometer. So 29.92 inches of mercury in a barometer is the standard pressure at sea level. So uh, obviously as you go up in altitude, they show in figure 5-3 here, the pressure goes down. So uh, at Denver, for example, which is about 5,000 feet, um, they have a pressure of 24.92. Uh, so um, it is decreased by about five inches of mercury in about 5,000 feet. Uh, so about an inch of mercury every thousand feet you go up. Now when we set our altimeters we get an altimeter setting which will be um, somewhere around 29.92 plus or minus a bit. Uh, you might hear anywhere from 28 something all the way up to maybe 31 something. But that's about the range of uh, pressures that we see. Now we set our altimeter to that setting, but uh, since we're a thousand feet above sea level here in Madison or thereabouts, um, you would expect that the standard pressure would actually be 28.92, right? Somewhere in that vicinity, right? And in fact, that is the pressure roughly that we experience. However, uh, in order to make a consistent measurement that we can use to set our altimeter in the airplane uh, wherever we are in the country or in the world regardless of what the ground elevation is they take that pressure that they read directly off a barometer and they correct it for the altitude of the ground so since if we're about a thousand feet above the ground or th excuse me a thousand feet above sea level here in Madison um, and if we lose about an inch of mercury per thousand feet, we go up. Well, if we have a barometer reading that we read uh, directly off the gauge of 28.92, we know we're a thousand feet up. We can add an inch of mercury to that for that thousand feet that we're up in altitude, and that gets us back up to 29.92, which is our standard. So, in order to have a consistent way of measuring it, you correct the uh, the atmospheric pressure for the altitude, and that gives us our altimeter setting that we then dilate. But the even at sea level, it could be below 2992. Oh yeah, it could be. As, as I said, the pressure range at sea level um, 
could be anywhere from you know 28 inches uh, all the way up to maybe 31 and a half inches. That's about the range that you see. You, you don't see it go below 28 inches very often. It may be maybe in the, maybe in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, you don't see it go above maybe 31 inches very often either. So that's about the range of pressures that you can expect. Now that will then have to be corrected for altitude, obviously, to get that that uh, reading that we're expecting in that normal range. I remember the old for weather forecast, they would say the pressure is 28, 92 and falling, which yeah. usually means lower pressure, cold fronts coming through, kind of for the weather novices and home yep. people. I mean, they don't really do that anymore, do they? I don't think so. In the I haven't weather. heard them say that very much anymore, but you might hear people talk about, um, so when the, the Edmund Fitzgerald uh, you know, ore freighter uh, was sunk, they talk about how bad the weather was that that day. Mm -hmm. And you might hear someone talk about the pressure, the air pressure, and they, it, I forget exactly what it was. I think it was something I didn't crazy. make a movie about that? They might have, I'm yeah. not sure, but it was crazy low pressure that mm -hmm. day. And that's part of the, re that was an indication of that uh, huge, huge storm that came through. Yeah. So they uh, have a chart here showing how uh, pressure uh, varies in millibars. So you have two different ways of measuring pressure that you'll encounter. Uh, the uh, imperial or you know U.S. units way of measuring it uh, in inches of mercury, or you can have it measured in millibars, which is essentially one thousandths of a standard pressure. Um, so a thousand millibars is about one atmosphere worth of pressure. Uh, now 29.92 inches actually equates to a thousand and twenty-one millibars, which is why, close enough. You know why they originally uh, said you know a thousand millibars is a standard atmosphere, and later at some point decided it was going to be a thousand and twenty-one. Who knows? That's up to the uh, uh, people who determine standards of measurement, and I uh, don't exactly know why they decided that. You just but have to deal with it. That's what they decided. Um, now, something else they talk about here, uh, which we talked about a little bit when we talked about, um, I think, in one of the previous ground schools, um, uh, as you go from high temperature to low temperature, uh, your altimeter reading can change. Um, and this is uh, showing something about that here. So warm air, because it expands, take up more space, um, the rate of change of pressure with altitude in warm air is less because the, uh, in order to be above the same amount of air, you have to travel further if the air is more spread out versus if it's cold and the air is contracted uh, as you go up in altitude you will uh, go you'll get above more of the air more quickly if the air is cold and compact than if it's warm well, and it makes spread sense out. you got a little box yeah. it's this big and then when it warms up it becomes this big but it's got the same number of air particles right in it. so to so get they take up more to get mm, above that warmer. same number of air particles, you, you have to go, go farther. Fur farther. Now, because of the fact that we have different uh, amounts of solar heating, which causes uh, different amounts of uh, temperature of the air, and as we talked about, warmer air is less dense, it expands more, and it also tends to rise, and cooler air tends to sink and contract. Uh, you'll have areas of higher pressure where it's you're getting more uh, solar energy, and areas of uh, higher pressure where you're getting less solar energy. And the uh, low pressure uh, areas are depicted on a weather chart. Uh, in this case, to figure 5-7, we show low pressure center, two low pressure centers um, near the middle of the country, and two high pressure centers uh, near 
one out by the Rockies and one sort of by the East Coast here. So what's happening here is the air is rising at those low pressure centers and it's sinking at the high pressure centers. So in order for the air to rise in one place and sink in another, it has to go from that one place to the other. So the air will tend to flow from a low pressure where the air rises mm -hmm. and expands to a high pressure where it, f it falls again and contracts. Um, so you'll see air um, essentially, at, if you look at what the air is doing at ground level, it'll appear that air is converging in towards a low pressure system and diverging out away from a high pressure system and that's because the low pressure system is taking air at the surface in and lifting it up and then it spreads out again when it gets up to high altitude and the same thing for a high pressure system the, it's sort of collecting the air at high altitude and it sinks and then it tends to spread out when it hits the ground so you have air generally flowing at the ground level generally flowing away from a high pressure system and towards a low pressure system that's how you get your east and west winds. Essentially, yes. Um, now, uh, in a perfect theoretical world with no other effects, the air would simply flow straight from the low uh, to the high. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, straight from the high to the low. But um, it doesn't tend to do that uh, because if we look at um, figure 7-8 and 7-9 um, we, uh, we see that as the air flows um, high pressure and towards a low pressure um, it will experience some friction with the ground so if the uh, if the air is flowing from a high to a low, um, it'll tend to get dragged along with the surface and uh, that will continue to sort of bend the air over uh, until the uh, what's called the pressure gradient force, the force that's uh, causing the air to want to move from the high to the low um, is essentially the same as the uh, the amount of resistance that it's feeling. We call this Coriolis force, the force that tends to bend air around in a circle. Once those are in equilibrium, you tend to have wind flowing along uh, a line of equal pressure. So instead of flowing from straight from a high to a low, it'll tend to bend around and uh, uh, follow the, the lines of pressure. Now, there's a couple things going on here. We talked about how it, it experiences um, friction with the ground, which slows it down, but also um, since the uh, the earth, if you cut a cross section of the earth looking from the top down, so from the sort of the north pole down, the earth is larger around at the equator than it is at the pole, obviously. So we all know that uh, in order to travel around a larger circle, if you ever you know, looked at a record or something, well, if anyone actually plays records anymore. Record <laughs> farther at the outer edge than it is at the inner right. edge. Right, so it's, it's far, uh, the point at the outer edge has to travel further than a point at the inner edge. So the air that's sitting around the earth, the air around the equator has to travel a further distance to go to rotate with the earth than the air that's near the pole, right? So as you, if the air flows to the north, uh, from the equator towards the pole, well now it's moving faster even though it's moved inwards towards the center of rotation. So now it's that air is moving faster than the earth and it will tend to bend as it flows north, it'll tend to bend around to the east 
so it'll bend to the right. Mm -hmm. And as it flows south, um, it's flowing, it's going from an area where it's got a smaller radius to an area where it's got a larger radius, so then it's moving slower than the ground, and then it tends to bend also to the right, so it bends to the west. And that's why as air flows outward from a high, it'll flow outwards in all directions, but the air that flows north tends to bend around to the east, and the air that flows south bends around to the west, and you get a clockwise circulation around a high pressure system as the air is flowing outwards away from it. And then the low pressure system uh, has the opposite happen because as the air curves around um, out from a high, it turns to the right, but if it's moving inwards towards a low, so if it's moving south inwards towards a low, it'll tend to bend to the right and go west. If it's moving north inwards towards a low, it'll tend to bend also to the right and go east. So you end up with a counterclockwise rotation around a low pressure system. And this is shown in figure 7-9 here. So the combination of the air uh, bending around because of its because it's moving closer or further from the center of rotation of the earth or and also experiencing friction with the ground um, because if there was no friction with the ground um, and you take air and you go uh, north well now the air is moving faster but if there were no friction it would just move keep moving faster and you'd just have air going over the surface at uh, in a uh, easterly direction um, but because the um, air gets slowed down by the surface through friction that's why the uh, you, you don't simply have the air moving the same speed continuously as it moves from the equator towards the pole. Otherwise we would have calm wind at the equator and the wind would get stronger and stronger and stronger as you move towards the pole until you just had a strong wind blowing around and around and around. That does happen to some extent but obviously we know that it's not always blowing 100 miles an hour in Canada mm -hmm. and it's not always calm in right. the Caribbean. So um, the reason for that is friction with the surface keeping the air more or less moving at the same speed as the ground underneath it. Um, now if we continue on in uh, chapter 5 here, um, there's a few more. Uh, we talked about how the warm air or cold air affects uh, an altimeter reading uh, 5-15 shows that. Uh, also, 5-17 shows it in a slightly different way. One final thing to talk about, um, obviously, we've already talked about in the aircraft performance section about how uh, with less dense air, aircraft performance goes down, and so as you go higher in the atmosphere or as the temperature goes up you get less aircraft performance. Um, so that is uh, part of the reason why we as pilots are concerned about um, the temperature and the density of air. So um, in summary of what we've talked about up through the end of chapter 5 here, um, we have differences in atmospheric heating, uh, which cause vertical movement of air. Vertical movement of air causes horizontal movement of air because the air rising in one place has to move and sink in another. That would simply go uh, straight from one to the other except for the fact that as we flow away from the equator the wind uh, tends to bend around due to moving closer to the center of rotation of the earth is viewed from the top. We call that Coriolis force that bends the wind around uh, to the side and uh, of course 
as we move further and further from the equator, that gets more and more pronounced. Uh, and you might think that uh, the wind would just get stronger and stronger and stronger as you move towards the pole, but of course we know that doesn't happen. So the friction with the surface keeps the air roughly uh, moving at the same speed as the earth underneath it, plus or minus a little bit which we experience as wind.